Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging land. Um, I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, acknowledge elders past and present, um, and that this is and will always be Aboriginal land. So welcome to our first webinar for Tripeaks of 2022, and we're off and running. Today's webinar is part of the Tripeak Initiative, which is a collaboration between the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare, the Victorian Healthcare Association, or VHA, and the Victorian Alcohol and Drug Association, VADA, to support integrated practice and good governance across our three sectors. And it stood us in incredible, incredible stead uh, during the last two years where we've been able to bring the three sectors together to really understand what's happening for us and around us during the global pandemic. I'd like to acknowledge my fellow CEOs, Tom and Sam. Now, just for some housekeeping, and we always like to put this slide up, this is a Zoom webinar, so please use the chat and Q&A functions for your questions and comments. Um, and at the end, if we have time, we'll also have a Q&A session with our great colleagues and friends. So as we kick off 2022, the Omicron variant has meant that COVID-19 has continued to take a, a front and centre position in our professional and personal lives. The strain on communities, workforces and systems has been intense. And as the variant appears to have reached its peak, there is an opportunity to examine the key learnings and insights from this period. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment, as I said, to acknowledge our, um, our elders who are with us today and also Aboriginal people that I'm sure are on this call. I'd like to take a moment to pay my respects to our frontline workers, including those of you who are joining us today, for everyone in health, aged care, alcohol and other drug, child and family services. We know the last few weeks have been incredibly taxing with a great deal of uncertainty. Despite this, frontline workers have continued to show up with resilience, strength, compassion and supporting people in our community who need it the most. So thank you from all of us to all of you. Now to this webinar. This webinar will explore the lessons learned from Omicron and examine the likely trajectory of the pandemic over the coming months, looking at insights from Australia and across the globe. This webinar will delve into the impacts and outcomes of the latest COVID-19 variant and explore what this means for 2022. Now, we are so lucky to have the support of um, Sonia Sharp and her team. Sonia keeps uh, ringing me and working with me and asking me what um, she can do to support our sector. And here she is again today. So Sonia is a partner in People Advisory Services at EY, having dedicated over 30 years to public service with 17 years as a senior executive in the UK, leading education and child and family services, and most recently as Deputy Secretary in the Victorian Government. Sonia is a partner in EY's at, at workforce advisory practice, um, as well as a national lead on public service workforce and COVID-19 response and recovery. A remarkable friend of this sector and very lucky to have leading edge information being shared with you today. Georgina, part of her team, is a director at EY also as an experienced workforce transformation organisational design and change consultant. Georgina works with public sector clients to transform their organisation, build their future workforce and create the right culture and experience for major organisational and system-wide change. Now, we also, at sort of very short notice, we're very grateful to have Naren Ryder here. She actually is now also one of our panellists from EY, and she's from the international team um, that's looking at international mobility. And I'm sure Sonia will introduce you as well, Naren, when we, when, when, we, when we get to the presentation. You may remember, and I hope you do, that Sonia and Georgina uh, from last year's webinars um, important to remember what they were, global workforce perspectives and practical strategies in COVID-19 and international insights on the impact of COVID-19 on child and family services. It's important to say uh, these women have been with us on the journey. Uh, they've educated and informed us over the last two years and we're very, very lucky to have them with us again today. So now I'm gonna hand over to Georgina, Sonia and Marin. Please welcome them virtually. 
Thank you so much, Deb, um, and, and welcome everybody. Um, uh, we would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're all dialing in from today. I'm joining you from the land of the Wurundjeri people, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and including any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues on the call with us today. Um, uh, thank you, Deb, for that very generous um, welcome. It's always a pleasure um, to work with the centre and Tri Peaks, um, and also with the sector. Those of you who know Georgie and I will know that we are passionate about what you do, um, and we will always want to do whatever we can to help the sector be as strong as it can be, particularly now, which is when we, um, uh, we need it most. I'm also really grateful to my fellow partner, Merrin Wright, who's joined us today. Now, during the COVID, you will have heard about borders being closed um, and, you know, some of the traumas that people who've wanted to return to Australia, connect with family through, during difficult times um, uh, have been through. And all through that, Merrin has been working tirelessly um, with some of the people who faced into the the most challenging circumstances around international travel and international connection and has been quietly moving people around and as she would say um, the borders can be more porous than we think they can if we know how now as you'll hear we're going into an exciting time because next week the borders will reopen um, and um, uh, and um, and so we um, uh, and so we'll be hearing from Merrin about what that, that means for us, particularly, as you'll also hear from us, we're facing into very, very significant workforce challenges. We've said this all along. We're now going to um, uh, reach into some opportunities, but also some challenges. So um, this is a session and I'm hoping that kind of the notes and the slides are working for you. Um, so I think we just need to move on a tiny bit, Georgie. So we've introduced the team. Um, so can, uh, I just jump, sorry, can I just go up to display settings and then just go to swap present to view and um, there. Oh, okay. Is it? Yeah, um, yeah we're just doing some. It's yeah, not we can. showing. Okay, give, yeah. bear with me one second. I'll start anyway, but Thanks. I wanted to start off um, with kind of a focus on hope and gratitude. Um, it is a long time, Deb and colleagues, um, since we first ran our first ever webinar um, and we didn't really know what we were facing into then. We thought we had a sense, but what we hear continually is that this is a virus that does what viruses do, um, but it, continue, it does continue to surprise us. And as we now have been exposed to Omicron, the super infectious child um, of um, Alpha, and remembering that we're already on our 15 variant and we're probably going to get more um, uh, but some I'll say a little bit more about that later um, uh, we'll all have had different emotions um, some of you sadly will have family friends colleagues who've passed away um, as a result of COVID um, most of you will now know somebody who has had COVID or has got COVID at the moment. We've gone from you know, knowing virtually nobody to most of us having somebody in our social circle or family circle who has had COVID. Some of those people will have had it very mildly, but some of those people will have been really, really sick. Um, uh, some of us, and I know I have, have, will have gone through troughs of despair at times when we, um, kind of reflect on this kind of sense of dystopian novel. None of, very few of us, there's a few people who were alive in the, the 1918 still, but most of us have not experienced anything like this in our lifetime. So we're learning it all the time. Um, we'll have a bias towards optimism most of the time, um, but there will be times when we're thinking, when will this end? Can it get any worse? What else can happen? Um, and some of us will have snarled at the system 
um, uh, at moments, whether it was, you know, the kind of those crunchy moments that go along with every um, uh, crisis, whether it's, you know, I've, I've gone to the shops to try desperately to get uh, rapid antigen tests, but I can't find one anywhere. Um, uh, I'm trying to book in for a vaccine, but there's no availability till February. Um, or um, I went for a PCR test because I want to go away with my family, but the result didn't come back in time. So I missed the week, which is what happened to me. Um, uh, but they're tiny, tiny moments and um, no critical incident is without crunch. And I actually think we have got a huge amount to be grateful for, for being here in Australia and also for being in Victoria. And our public servants have done the most incredible job, I think, um, uh, as have our politicians. Um, we've got so much to be grateful for. What If we look at where we are now compared with we were two years ago, we know how to keep ourselves safe now. And by and large, we've got access to the means to do so. We know about vaccination and we've got one of the highest vaccination rates in the world. Um, uh, we know about the importance of ventilation and we live in a country where an outdoor lifestyle is, um, is, is, a, is possible most of the time. Um, we know about we've got a government that's put ventilation and, um, uh, in, and filters in, in most key public spaces, in particular schools. We understand about the importance of mask wearing and social distancing um, uh, and, um, and have the ability to keep ourselves and others safe. We also have a hospital system that has been strained but has not been totally overwhelmed. And I know some of us in Victoria will have kind of gone through those kind of gloomy moments when it's yet another lockdown. But what we've got to remember is that each of those lockdowns has helped us to protect the health system until we could get these protective factors in, 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 in place so that now we will be able to, by and large, protect ourselves and each other. Um, and also, as we'll hear from Meryn in a bit, we, our borders are reopening. And for many of us who've not been able to see or connect with families or friends, whether that's in Australia um, or overseas, um, then we have the possibility of doing so going forward. So there's a lot to be grateful for. And also, and I must say, and you'll see the little picture of the hamster there. I, I also think as well that when we think of ourselves as humans, we've got to remember that this is a, a pandemic that's not only touched us, it's touched wildlife and animal life as well um, and particularly I feel terribly sad about the poor hamsters who have proved to be terribly susceptible um, to coronavirus um, and um, and in some countries um, are being culled in masses and and so it's it's good to remember that we're not the only species in this world affected by this um, uh, situation so um, so I wanted to start with hope because we're in a better place than we've ever been before. And although it'll be a bit tricky, we've now got the tools um, to be able to live in a safe um, way, even though it might mean we do things a bit differently. If we move to the next slide. Um, so what are we what are we seeing? So this is the big picture. Um, so we, um, what, what we, I think we all probably become experts in what is a pandemic anyway. Um, but remembering that our public health colleagues in the on the call or or that we're connected with will tell us that that a pandemic has kind of four key components to it. You have. Um, or in, infectious diseases have four key components. You have outbreaks, um, and in some instances, outbreaks happen and it goes no further. Um, then, um, and, and contagion when things spread, that's the kind of first two stages. Then we get to pandemic, and pandemic is when we have widespread contagion of an infectious disease around the world, which is where we've been with Omicron. It has been unstoppable. It's gone everywhere. Um, there are a few small places that um, that have, have managed Managed to stay COVID free, but they're tiny and, and, and very far and few between. Um, and what we're all waiting for is what happens next. Now then, there is a possibility, as we've seen with some infectious diseases like smallpox, um, uh, um, uh, that we can actually um, push it out or measles, we can push it out of the system and then we just get small outbreaks in the future. What's most likely to happen and what ha happens with flus and common colds is we're going to move into an endemic with, um, uh, with, uh, with, with COVID, which is where we'll have outbreaks. 
and it'll just like flu, um, we will have different strains emerging. And as is often the case with the virus, but not always, as often is the case with the virus, it wants to survive. So it becomes more transmissible, but less severe. And that's what we're seeing at the moment um, with, um, uh, um, with COVID. And we're hoping that that's the way it's going. Of course, it would be amazing if it dropped out and we were able to suppress it completely and, 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 and only have minor outbreaks at the moment. But our epidemiologists and public health specialists are saying it's more likely to go to endemics, more likely to be like flu and cold. Um, uh, and so how we live going forward with it is going to be um, important. And we need to remember, we manage flu in this country extraordinarily well. Um, so what do we have and what do we need to do going forward? These things are going to become our way of living so that we maintain our layers of protection and our lifestyle changes, just as we do with flu. Um, uh, we know that in the interim, and I'll, we'll talk more about this later in this session, we're definitely going to have to focus on workforce planning and collaboration, because those of you who know people who have been affected by COVID, some of them, as I've said, will just had a sniffle, but, the, but there are a, a large number of people who are experiencing this as a flu. It is a flu virus um, or re related to a flu virus and affects us like a flu virus. And what we're seeing is that a lot of people are much sicker than they thought they were um, and they are ill for maybe three to even six weeks. Um, so workforce planning and collaboration is going to be really important and we'll give you share with you some statistics and impacts of what we're seeing in workforces across Australia and around the world. Um, so what we should be thinking about. We have had a digital revolution. Our digital maturity now is such that we can be hybrid and make that work for us um, uh, going forward. And I think all of us have had a greater focus on well-being and will continue to do so, both mental well-being and physical well-being. So these are kind of some things that we need to keep working on and we need to keep current. Um, what we must, and, and again, in my kind of hopeful and grateful um, beginning, is that we are absolutely blessed by um, our frontline workforce across health and human services, um, police and other, um, uh, uh, and, and all of those other workforces who help us keep safe um, distribution, um, supply chain in, in, um, in, in the food industry, et cetera, because, but particularly in our health and human services, what we're seeing is extraordinary self-sacrifice, you know, people who are willing to risk their health and well-being to support us. Um, uh, we have seen extraordinary resilience, um, but we are seeing also um, our workforces after two years facing challenges of burnout, fatigue and stress and no more so than in the health sector. Um, uh, um, and, um, and also support um, that we're seeing people who, despite great challenges, are generous and kind in their support to each other, um, even though that we're all facing pressures of our own, whether those personal family pressures or um, workplace pressures. And also we're seeing innovation. We've demonstrated the ag agility and the ability to navigate ch changing contexts and deliver services in really different ways. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later as well. And some of the kind of promising practices that are, have emerged since the last time that we spoke. Um, let's move on. Thanks, Eve. <laughs> um, I'm going to hand okay. over to Georgie now, who's yeah. going to talk us through a little bit about, well, what do we know about Omicron? Some of this will be familiar. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Georgie, off you go. Thanks, Sonia. Um, so when we look around the world and and uh, and draw on our, our colleagues um, in the health sectors and and community services sectors globally, um, we you know we see a number of things emerging about Omicron that um, you know many much of which you may have heard of and through um, through the press and and uh, available research. Um, but I guess the first thing we we did see Omicron emerge um, in October last year, and obviously um, it began uh, out in South Australia. South Africa rather and quickly spread around the world. Um, uh, we did see though uh, that, that there was evidence pretty early on that the, that, that was really resulting in some increased transmissibility of the, the virus and um, and starting to contribute to some significant growth in case numbers in, uh, in many jurisdictions and countries. 
Um, we have seen, particularly around Europe and, and the Americas, um, you know, pretty steep surges in, in case numbers and, um, and, and quite broad impacts across the community, um, the population and, and services as well. Uh, one of the things that's a bit of a point of um, debate is around the severity of Omicron. I think initially we, we were all um, uh, hearing and, and uh, the initial signs and research indicated that it was lower in terms of severity. Uh, but in actual fact, I think that um, that is becoming much more mixed in terms of the evidence there. And um, uh, with, with variation in, in patterns around severity, depending on the jurisdiction and a range of factors. But what we are really seeing is that that um, in terms of the, the rate of transmission, the rate at which uh, case numbers double is uh, it has um, radically uh, decreased. So, that, so we are seeing very steep increases. Um, it is definite uh, that the, that the um, Omicron variant is increasing, um, has resulted in increased transmissibility and, um, and also contributing to uh, the incidence of secondary infection amongst some of the population. Um, we're seeing as well that as a result of these rapid surges in cases that um, that, our, uh, that that is having an impact on our health and emergency services workforces. Um, we, we've certainly seen that um, around Australia in terms of um, uh, ambulance services and others, but that is a common trend around the world as they face into workforce shortages and also significant pressure as a result of um, a demand from the community. Um, we are seeing that uh, that the with the growth in case numbers, there are um, increasing rates of hospitalisation around the world, and that's that is a bit variable across different locations and communities. But overall, um, definitely a trend towards higher rates of hospitalisation, um, and particularly you know in many countries. Although we initially felt that it would be less severe, we are seeing that um, in some countries and some states around um, the US and and uh, provinces in Canada and, and so forth that, um, that we're, they're actually seeing rates of hospitalisation uh, far greater than at the peak of the, of the Delta strain. Um, and as a result of some of those high case numbers, again, also seeing um, greater rates of mortality uh, as well. When we look at some of the specifics around, um, around the impact on case numbers across different jurisdictions and countries, um, we do see some pretty marked um, increases, but it's interesting. I think the, uh, there is a, a widespread recognition that the, um, that the experience of each country and, and, um, and communities within uh, does vary around the globe and, and is dependent on a range of factors. Um, in the US, we have seen that um, case numbers have really grown from around 53 million overall in December up to 75 million um, in the month of February. Um, in the UK, we've seen them grow from around 13 million in December through to 17 million in February. Um, in New Zealand, our, our um, counterparts across um, across the, tra the Tasman, we've, we have really seen that um, uh, a growth from around 13,000 overall up to about 17,000 in February. And here in Australia, I think almost, um, uh, as you can see, our numbers have been pretty low and, and steady throughout Delta and, and uh, prior variants with many of our efforts on lockdowns and, and so forth. But now, um, you know, clearly we're, we're seeing the, um, the, that significant growth in case numbers. And, and in the month of February to date, we've had um, 2.3 million roughly um, reported. So um, some of the variations though in the experience across countries, um, what is clear is that there are a range of factors that are impacting on the experience. And we, we do um, expect, and the evidence is showing that there will be um, in most countries a peak followed by a, a decline um, in, in the Omicron case numbers. Um, but that the timing of that and the, um, the, the, the pattern of that is, is quite variable. That is really dependent on uh, things like the, the demographics of the population and, and, um, and we're particularly seeing uh, trends towards um, uh, greater impacts and, and growth in case numbers across um, lower socioeconomic areas. Uh, we are seeing that the rate of vaccination within the country and the rate of boosters and, and access to those is having a significant impact on, on the trajectory of, of Omicron and the experience of, um, of those countries and, and areas. Um, as well as the quality of their health of healthcare systems, and and um, you know many of many of our healthcare systems have adapted pretty significantly throughout 
uh, throughout the last two years, as have our um, counterparts, counterparts around the world. But we are really seeing that, um, uh, you know, where we, where we have really high quality healthcare systems with strong um, infection prevention controls and, and um, have really developed and cemented those um, approaches throughout the past two years, that is um, improving their ability to cope with Omicron. But certainly seeing um, impacts, particularly in terms of the, um, as we were saying, the rate of hospitalisation and, and also the rate of um, uh, ICU presentations as well. Um, and the baseline from previous surges is also another factor. So um, uh, at where we've had um, a, you know, a lot of community um, experience of COVID-19 in the past, um, that is, uh, is playing out in, in their experience of Omicron today. Um, and uh, policies that are in place around, around um, uh, in terms of the way that the uh, society is, uh, is uh, catering to COVID-19, um, to the extent to which they've applied um, future subsequent lockdowns, mask wearing and social distancing and density requirements, they've all also had a factor in, in the experience. Um, and so it's really quite hard to tell uh, and predict exactly what is going to occur in the, in the forward outlook for Omicron, um, although there is general recognition that we will reach a peak, uh, it will start to decline, uh, but there are so many factors at play that will influence the way that that um, plays out. Right, and I'll now um, hand back to Sonia to talk about the way in which Omicron is uh, impacting on children and, and our more vulnerable children as well. Okay, good. Before we do that, I just noticed I was just replying actually, but I'll say it instead. A um, question about hospital about hospitalizations. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. So the reason for the increased um, rate in hospitalization um, uh, is to do with the volume of people. So Omicron has become is because it's so transmissible and it's chain. It's a very different strain. It's you know mostly in the upper um, respiratory tract rather than going down into the lungs, which is why we're not seeing the fatalities that we did see before, but what we're seeing is many, many more people are getting it because it's so hugely infectious. And then as particularly as infection hits more vulnerable populations, then we're seeing increased hospitalisation and um, uh, and uh, fatalities within within those populations by and large, um, which is why protection for more vulnerable people is really important. And one of the big themes I think we've all been aware of and has been a conversation that we've had before is about some of the challenges around in inequality um, and, and, and equity um, of, um, of some of those protective factors that we've 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 heard about so far um, so far today. Um, there is a small all amount of evidence emerging but I wouldn't I'm um, again going to sources we mostly we use medical um, medical peer-reviewed journals and also the centers for disease I am not a doctor or an epidemiologist but we connect with them and um, and read peer-reviewed articles but um, there is a small amount of, um, uh, of information that indicates that for very young children under four there there is a although omicron is all of the all of the um uh, um, COVIDs have been generally mild for children. Um, there's a, there are a small number of, of children, very young children, who seem to um, develop other respiratory complications. Um, but still, I think, you know, we're Sharon Goldfield or our colleagues from the Royal Children's Hospital or Murdoch here with us today, they'd be saying relatively to some other stuff that children get, it's actually mild. Um, so, um, Deb, did all oh, right. So anyway, so yeah, so challenges for children. Um, so, um, so it's hugely infectious, and they are little super spreaders. Um, uh, which, by the way, with Omicron, might be a really good thing because one of the things that we're we're hearing again, emerging evidence, um, uh, is that um, if once we've had Omicron, it does seem that the 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 medical professionals or our and epidemiologists are hopeful that that will provide greater protection. Um, that 
that to some of the other strains that might come through. Um, uh, but we are seeing, so we're seeing two things. We're seeing, although that we're getting peak and then it's dropping, we are seeing still increases in the zero to 14 year olds who are um, uh, uh, catching Omicron. And interestingly, in the 35 to 49 year old population as well, um, those are global figures. Um, and that, um, and there's, there's, and they are, te they tend to be the parents. And what we do see is, and you'll hear about this later, is where there are childcare centres and schools and there are outbreaks in them, then that spreads through community. So there's community transmission related to that. So, um, uh, but the really good thing is that we are so well vaccinated um, here and now our um, five plus rates are going up as well. So we're in a better and better position um, and the public health measures that we have taken and need to continue to take are, are really helping to protect our children and young people um, from the from 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 Omicron. Um, but we are seeing some inequities in the system and we are seeing some challenges for some of our more vulnerable children and young people and their um, their families. What we've seen in places where there's poorer access to um, uh, um, strong medical care, such as the experience of some of some South African communities, is that hospital admissions are have been 25 percent have been significantly higher during Omicron than they were during Delta. That's partly to do with transmissibility. Um, uh, what we are hearing is that the social and psychological impacts of living in a pandemic are having a negative impact on some children and young people. Um, uh, and so lots of parents are saying, I'm really worried about my kid and what this is doing for them um, and their experience, whether that's to do with um, social contact with family members, um, loss of a grandparent and ber uh, bereavement, um, living it at home all the time and limited social interactions um, uh, um, and um, and also um, exposure um, and uh, uh, inability to avoid abusive or unsafe um, situations. We also know that that we are seeing an economic impact. And, you know, if we look at the retail sector, um, though you'll have read probably an article in The Age earlier this week where, you know, the, we were, or AF and AFR talking about the massive impact on the creative industries and retail and hospitality. Small and medium businesses struggle to make, struggling to make ends meet. Um, and that also then having a, a financial impact on many families' economic well-being. We're also um, uh, seeing some impacts of the schooling system um, um, being open and closed. Now, by and large, we've done really well, actually, again, in Victoria, the Department of Education has done a tremendous job in getting laptops um, and connectivity out to all families. Teachers have done an extraordinary job in switching the way that they teach. Um, and support students in, in their learning. But we are hearing and seeing globally um, about some emerging concerns. There's not a strong evidence place for this at all of, of um, what, is it, what is it like in terms of um, language development to be not exposed to be um, not exposed to a variety of linguistic environments or to be mask wearing. And certainly for children in the deaf community, we're hearing um, that that's putting significant strain, not being able to see people's faces um, uh, while they're talking. And so in the educational community just this week, there's a big global debate around, can we really catch up this time? Um, I would say, well, we might not. And you know what? it probably doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we're all in the same boat and we will develop. But what we do need to do is watch out for those equity issues um, and more vulnerable families. Um, we're also seeing that um, uh, teachers, um, so yes, I've, I've covered that already. So, um, so kind of education impacts. Um, uh, what we have seen, and luckily we haven't seen much of this in Australia, which is fantastic, but what we are seeing globally is what's been called the great orphaning. Now, for those of us in this call, this will be horrendous because, you know, we've heard about the great resignation. We've heard about the great cancellation. But but this great orphaning is something that has really, really happened. Um, it's, it's sort of like over a million children around the world have experienced the death of their primary caregivers. Um, uh, um, and um, 
uh, and uh, and one and a half, um, and that would that would include you know grandparents etc. With one and a half um, uh, million um, in that group of primary or secondary, and also what we're seeing as well is that because um, men are more likely to die from COVID than women for a whole variety of factors, um, that actually children are far more likely to lose their father than they are their mother. So there's many family like so many families have been affected by this and when we talk numbers we're always conscious that every number is a person every number is somebody's loved one um but these are, are, are big numbers and many children have been left bereaved alone and and needing support and and for some of them they've, they've come into the care system as a result of that mm -hmm. um if we move so so just some kind of like some good news for children but also some things that again um that we need to be mindful of when we think about the challenges for children particularly that mental health health and well-being the ability to socially connect um and and those many children in australia who will have lost a grandparent an auntie and uncle So, um, I mean, there's no doubt that across all of our sectors, we are seeing some, some pretty um, pronounced workforce impacts at the moment. Uh, many of you will no doubt be um, working, managing through uh, periods of, of staff absences due to, um, due to isolation and, and uh, staff who are COVID positive. Um, and also really having to navigate, um, you know, families that um, staff that might might be uh, home due to caring for a child that that is COVID positive um, with a, you know, a, a lot of experiences over the over both the summer holidays and and now into the school year. Um, uh, we it's interesting, I think, when we reflect on this uh, over the past year, we were observing a lot of workforce impacts around the world um, with with countries that did have high case numbers. And that really perhaps hadn't hit us uh, quite to the same extent here with um, our successful lockdown. Certainly some of our sectors, such as aged age care, had very much um, experienced some real challenges around workforce and, and particularly um, sectors that have uh, that that have um, practitioners and, and workers who might work across multiple sectors and and uh, and there's been a need for some really careful planning. But the good thing is, I think that that much of the the workforce contingency planning over the past year, um, it is really now coming to the point where that is that um, that most one of the most critical things. Um, interestingly, around the world, we with the uh, growth in case numbers from Omicron, we are now seeing even more pronounced impacts on the workforce. Um, when we think about the education sector, um, very much seeing in uh, both impacts for children uh, and absences as well as staff. In the UK, we're seeing um, one in 10 teachers are, are absent at any one time due to COVID related reasons. We're hearing in Canada, for instance, that, um, that their current policy is for staff to, to remain at home um, with, uh, with any COVID-like symptoms, regardless of whether they're COVID positive or not. So, that, that, so those sorts of um, uh, approaches are having real impacts on, um, on ability to maintain education services and, and, um, and, su and support students um, in, their, in their learning outcomes. Um, uh, and it's interesting as well that uh, that you know we're, we're, that is really also translating into the the numbers of, of children also impacted and and um, and either isolating at home or, or having to access um, home learning, and the inequities that that uh, that that presents still today. When we look at our health and, and uh, community services, um, there's there's no doubt again that uh, even if we think in Victoria, we are experiencing some pretty, um, you know, clear workforce impacts at the moment. Um, and we hear across many of our sectors that that you are experiencing, you know, a, a regular. Um, a gap of at least five to ten percent at any one time, and some services up to thirty percent um, uh, as well. And we know that uh, that many of our services are going above and beyond, uh, not only to to try and maintain um, services to children and families, um, but also having to uh, you know going above and beyond to support families that might be um, uh, and caregivers that might be uh, experiencing COVID nineteen at this point in time as well. Um, there, there are some real patterns around the globe and, and, uh, and really I think the message here is just more pronounced than, than, than last year. 
um, uh, and, and that is both in terms of um, in terms of the, the presence of COVID nineteen within the workforce and and the impacts on um, on workforce supply and um, and continuity. Uh, across the health and community care sectors, but also, um, you know, seeing some some of the research and uh, evidence that uh, healthcare workers are uh, seven times more likely to develop more severe cases of COVID nineteen than than other other um, workforces, and uh, an ongoing sustained impact on on mental health across the sector. As um, as we know that everyone is really seeking, really trying to grapple with how they continue to to maintain their own personal resilience and and um, um, and focus how they can continue to to um, do the great work they're doing with with families and, and children, but at the same time um, dealing with significant gaps in in their teams and and uh, and services uh, and 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 really high demand as well. Uh, and we know also, of course, that our supply chains and other sectors are being affected too. And um, and Sonia mentioned earlier the impact on the creative industries. Um, clearly, we're, we're seeing here in Australia um, some many impacts on our supply chains, um, and that's a global occurrence as well. Uh, and not only is that impacting on, on the, the population as a whole in, in being able to access, um, uh, you know, day-to-day -day goods, but, but it's also impacting on the ability to support uh, families with, um, with basic needs and, uh, and, uh, and food relief and other, and other um, practical goods. Um, so, so I think this is something that we're really experiencing globally at the moment. Um, Sonia, uh, I'll hand back to you because we're now going to uh, just really look ahead. And I think whilst we are experiencing many challenges at the moment, um, I think it really does highlight that all the contingency planning that many of our workforces have been, have been uh, and services have been doing over the past year um, is really coming into its own now and, and, um, uh, and part of the focus for this year going forward. We will continue to see impacts on the workforce, but the good thing is that um, to a degree we're, we're managing through that. Um, but we do need to keep a focus on how we support um, our practitioners and our workforces um, through this, this time. Thank you very much. We just had a question in the chat um, about more vulnerable people, people with disability or people with um, underlying health conditions. And certainly what we know, we do know that that particular those that particular group of people are more vulnerable to severe, more severe illness and um, uh, more like um, potentially more likely to be hospitalized. Not not all the time, but, but there's a higher risk, which is why um, that those groups of people have been prioritized for the antiviral, the new antiviral treatments um, uh, and um, uh, and also um, continue. I think again, when we think about workforce and we think about um, our workforce and our clients, we need to continue to be careful with those layers of protection um, around people who are more vulnerable, including um, opportunities for flexible working, which is where I'll come to now, because um, there continue to be some emerging um, promising practice. The last time we talked about voluntary the boom in volunteering and hyperlocalism, so small place-based teams working together um, across agencies. A couple of things that have really emerged since we last spoke, um, I don't know if we want to move the slide on it, is first of all, um, oh, is um, borders being open? Merin, we, in terms of our workforce issues, we can now start to recruit from overseas. Yes, thanks, Sonia. So I thought I might just spend um, a couple of minutes just firstly on where are we at with the border? <laughs> who can enter? Who can't? And what does the 21st of February opening date announcement really mean? And then secondly, just a few comments on the work visa program as it relates to the health sector. So after almost now two years of very tight restrictions. Australia's border will open for fully vaccinated travellers on the 21st of February, so just a week and a half to go. And this follows uh, what's been a, a gradual relaxation of that border closure over recent months um, to address skill shortages and support the economy. So the recent changes have already, they've had an immediate impact. Um, so between November 2021 and, and January 2022, 22,000 working holiday maker visas were granted for 
young people to come into Australia um, and, and, and live and work for a time. And during that, that reasonably short period as well, over 8,000 skilled temporary work visas were granted. More than 43,000 international student visa holders arrived um, and around 60,000 um, visiting family members also came into the country. So visas are being granted, people are traveling and the Department of, of Home Affairs is scaling up for, for what is really enormous demand in Australia's migration program. So in terms of travel from the 21st of February on, um, what that date will mean is, is really firstly, the list of eligible visas um, who currently don't have a, a travel ban exemption requirement, that list will become redundant. Um, Business visitor visas will be the best um, and fastest option for fully vaccinated business travellers. Inbound tourism will resume. And also for those employees who are on bridging visas or even um, more broadly, um, this open border really brings about the possibility of visiting um, people visiting their home country and re-entering Australia without those issues of the border closure. And so that I think it's going to have an enormous boost in, in terms of well-being across the workforce. Um, and so just on to the work visa program and some comments there. So the subclass 482 visa or temporary skill shortage visa is the most appropriate for skilled staff um, for employers to utilise, requires sponsorship by an employer. The program has been fully operational due, during this two-year um, border closure, albeit with decreased demand. Um, and late last year, the requirement for an exemption to the closed border fell away, which was really welcome news for employers. The visa program is split into two streams. So firstly, a short-term stream, and secondly, a, a medium to long-term stream. The short-term stream operates through, through an initial two-year visa and no pathway to permanent residence. And the long-term stream operates um, as a, as a four-year visa and a pathway to permanent residence. Most health professionals fall into that long-term list, so the ability to, to have a pathway to, to permanent residence. I bring this level of detail because permanent residence is really critical to attracting and retaining many candidates. I would have once said it was important, and now I've elevated that to critical as many people are seeking security in terms of their immigration status. Um, and, and just observation in servicing clients in this sector is that there is great value in looking at foreign national candidates and employees long-term, having a long-term view. Um, and this really means ensuring that candidates um, are granted the right visa in the right stream to provide that, that PR pathway. Without that view, candidates are looking elsewhere um, initially or through some point in their employment um, so that they're not left vulnerable at the end of that temporary visa. So this approach really, really is key. And I think now it's timely to, very timely to, to look at this with greater access to international recruitment, to think through this planning, to ensure the right policy and framework is in place um, for you as an employer. Uh, and, and of course, having that view to the long-term to really ensure you're getting the best out of, out of Australia's migration program. And just perhaps one final comment there um, is that migration planning uh, by the Department of Home Affairs for FY23 is underway at the moment. Submissions were invited back in December. Um, we certainly put one through and advocated for a return to higher um, skilled migration levels. My view is that the government will continue to support skilled migration and, and pathways to permanent residence and comments from both the Liberal and, and Labor parties have been similarly supportive. So I, I think all of that is really welcome and, and good news. So I'll, I'll leave it there, Sonia. Thank you. Thanks so much, Merrin. And by the way, there was a request for you to just pop those statistics that you um, mentioned in the chat, if you wouldn't mind doing that. So, um, so Will great do. opportunity for those of us, particularly in the human services sector, who have recruited um, traditionally some from overseas as part of the kind of um, uh, um, workforce management strategy. So, um, so positive outlook there, um, and really encouraging. So, um, if we just move on, a couple of things, then we'll move. So, a couple of promising practices that we just want to finish with is that first of all, um, what we've seen is that the era of digital social work and human services is here. 
um, with um, a, a real wealth of practice around hybrid anticipatory and flexible practice. And interestingly, what there's been some uh, research recently, um, uh, which has shown, which has actually tracked the, the experience and attitude of both clients and also um, uh, members of um, prof you know, professionals within the workforce about their attitudes and experience um, of using digital means of engagement. And at the outset of the pandemic, people were generally cautious, like very, very comfortable with face-to-face -face practices, um, cautious about trust issues, ethics issues, etc., cetera, um, uh, around moving to digital ways of engaging, whether that's over smartphone or iPads um, uh, um, or chat, um, uh, um, with a kind of emphasis on relationship-based skills are really important. I do that in person. Um, the comfort of a physical in-home assessment in terms of, you know, is, 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 the, is the place smelly, dirty, um, you know, what's being, you know, being able to pick up the vibes of, um, uh, of home dynamics and social dynamics, um, and also more comfort with formal modes of communications. What we've seen, roll forward the clock two years, and we've seen a real shift both from a client perspective and also a workforce perspective. So now people are much more comfortable, both clients and workers, with a blend of formal and informal communication modes. And it, interestingly, an increasing number of reports and uh, um, showing that, um, both client and work for workers have seen some benefits of having a hybrid method of engaging with a, a an ability to develop even a greater level of intimacy than you might get in a home face to face visit. And also some really promising trends in terms of um, clients, both particularly young people and also parents and family members being more proactive about reaching out to their um, human services um, workforce. I can, James, I will actually, that's right, with them. Um, uh, um, it's a paper for one of the research houses in the UK, so we can pop that. What we'll do is when we send out the pack, we've got references in it, so we'll pop that through to you. And it's a really interesting paper, well worth a read. And there's some other um, research that sits behind it, but there's one paper in particular which I'm really excited about. Um, so this generation of new modes of relationship development and also kind of ways of flexible working. So really promising um, uh, uh, practice there. The other thing that I'm tremendously excited about as well well, is um, some work that our EY colleagues in the in the US have been doing, um, where they've been looking at prevention of outbreak and management of outbreak through predictive analytics. So what they've done is that they've used data and predictive analytics um, to look at um, and be able to predict with 85% of accuracy where they're going to be significant outbreaks in a particular service. Um, in time to be able to do something. Now, what they've done there is that they produce this kind of analysis on a daily basis. Um, and um, the local government department has then a task force that they deploy um, uh, who go and work with that service so they can put in additional measures to reduce infection spread um, uh, um, and also provide search workforce where possible. Plus also services are clustering together um, to collaborate and work together so that on a place-based level, you actually have a teaming approach across different services who previously may have been in competition with each other. The key, they, they look at a whole range of predictive um, uh, factors um, and they've got a, a very sophistic sophisticated algorithm. But the key five, the big five that emerge as really important are staff to client ratios and severity of workforce gaps. So those services that have got a, got a low, like high, sorry, like a a lower number of staff and a higher number of clients. Um, vaccination rate among staff, clients, and the community in which the service is delivering. Um, previous practice in prevention and control. What is the sickness rate of this service normally? And what they do is they look at um, uh, service delivery over the previous three years and, um, uh, and you know, how effective are they in controlling flu outbreaks and, and other things? And they see that as a really big risk factor. So how good are you at this? Um, Interesting for all of us here, proximity to outbreaks in um, childcare, school and community. So if there's a if there's a, 
a, a, a service where, that, that for children and young people within five miles um, uh, in urban areas or 15 miles within rural areas, that is a risk factor and, and a hospital within a five mile radius. Um, so really interesting. And as you can see, this is the kind of map that they're able to come up with. They're able to say this service here um, is really high risk of a big outbreak um, in their workforce um, and their client group if it's a residential setting. Um, uh, and so that, but in enough time to be able to take um, uh, proactive steps to reduce the likelihood of, of spread, both amongst clientele, but most particularly amongst workforce. And they, what they've seen is a real reduction in hospitalization and fat fatalities through using this kind of predictive approach. I think that's fantastic. Um, okay, let's finish because we need time for a couple of questions. So what is next? What are the next steps? Very briefly, just summarising the big themes we've heard today um, is, um, first of all, let's really make sure that we are looking after ourselves and our workforce. Um, workforce health and wellbeing has got to be paramount for this year. We've got to be sympathetic um, uh, and flexible in our approach. We have to have a short, medium and long term strategy to attracting growing and training and developing and retaining talent and that includes mobility as well and so therefore our workforce planning um, uh, is more important than ever before. Thank you so much. Thanks Deb. Thanks Merrin and thanks Georgie. Wow that was huge that was such covered such a lot of ground Sonia Georgie and Marin, that was fantastic. Now we um, are there. Are there any? Is there anybody that really wants to sort of ask a question? We've got we've got tons of stuff coming up in the chat. Um, we might just go through a few of those. Can I just say, Marin, that I didn't think anybody was coming into the country. So what you you have just busted this. I uh, busted myths for you. I mean, <laughs> and I, I don't know about others on the chat, but that really has blown my mind. And one of the reasons why we needed all that hotel quarantine and what was really, really hard to run. There were so many people coming into the country. But that's really, uh, so I can only imagine the enormous numbers of people that would ordinarily come in, come in and out of the country if that's the number that was coming. And do you want to make a comment about that? Because that is just a myth, a myth buster there. Yeah, that's right. And I do think that there was certainly a wide held perception that borders closed equal borders closed as you would expect it, it yeah. you know sort of sort of sounds obvious but but actually the migration program did continue to operate it although had a very heavy overlay with the Australian border force putting in place a travel ban exemption process um, which really meant that only those with very critical skills and or in very critical sectors or a particularly compelling or compassionate set of circumstances um, could enter so so there was that overlay but certainly uh, it was still workable and a, a, a huge number of people took advantage of, of that process that was available uh, the gradual reopening really started in November last year. So that lift of that travel ban exemption requirement is what has equaled those numbers um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that I mentioned yeah. at the call there. But but I really think, I mean, I'm seeing enormous demand um, from, from our employer clients. Yeah. And I think over the coming months, there is really going to be a surge. And as I mentioned, the, the Department of Home Affairs is gearing up to a degree for that acknowledge that they need to provide you know reasonably fast efficient service um there yeah so so there you go so a, a Thank bit you of myth so busting. much there, there, look there are a couple of well very one quick question before we we close but this sort of emerging new variant Sonia so the planning for the future I think you're absolutely right about workforce if we don't have a workforce if we're not we are in all sorts of trouble because that's what's got us through apart from the prevention stuff over the last couple of years What's your sort of thinking about the what, what's coming ahead? Is it much more that we're going to have to live with it anyway? Um, you know, the brothers and sisters of Delta that you talk about, is that is that sort of what the, the you know, our, our scientists are saying? Yeah, is, yes. And I will put a caveat in that at the moment, because uh, even the world's leading epidemiologists and scientists who are studying this all the time, every single one of them, without exception, starts every single presentation they do or anything they write with 
this is what we think at the moment, but we keep on being surprised by this um, virus. So it's really hard to say there isn't a kind of clear cut crystal um, ball, but the likelihood is if we look at virus behavior and we look at where we're going at the moment and where we're tracking, um, the likelihood is, is there will continue to be variants. Um, some may be a bit stronger, some may be a bit weaker, um, uh, but probably if the virus continues to do what viruses typically do, we can expect any new variants to be um, usually they go to be they become more more infectious but less severe um, and that's what we hope will happen um, so it will become like our seasonal flus and remember in our flu season normally we get we might get two or three or four different strains um, uh, and our health um, uh, and pharmaceutical colleagues are brilliant at like getting on top of that straight away, developing a vaccine so we can all get our flu shots. Um, we have flu shots in our workplace. They're really easy to get. Um, so that's going to be hopefully where we um, go to. But what we do know is that it's it, for the time being, at least, um, then it's very likely that more of our workforce are going to be affected. Either they, their family will get it and they'll have to look after them or, or they will get it themselves and so um and 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 it is like a flu so i think that's really important is that what we and we've seen this in ey we've seen people who have um uh caught covid thought they were ready to come back to work and then had to take another two to three weeks off because they're not that's right um, uh and people being very fatigued and a risk of, of uh, an increased risk then of post-viral fatigue so we we have to take this seriously and certainly we're talking to our workforce about like you know if you get this rest recover don't rush back um and with with home working people can do little bits and bobs if they want to but we, we but we really need to take it serious and that's why we've got to have a contingency plan and whether that's through local teaming across services so i would be suggesting to all of you if you haven't done already you know be working with the local services in your area to think about how you could support each other um look at workforce rotors we're seeing some creative things like um say for example services grouping up in threes or fours and actually having a combined rotor roster yeah. um so they're actually working as one organization across three or four um have an a team b team c team so don't have all your team in at the same time so you've got good infection control make sure that people one of the really important things that's coming through is the importance of well-fitted high grade masks um uh and um including for children so in some childcare centers and schools where kids have got really well fitted masks they're the proper kn95 and and properly fitted and they know how to fit them there's hardly any cases yeah yeah it's interesting is all of those preventative uh things that you talked about right at right the beginning yeah. sonia georgie Marin, brilliant the comments you know the comments in the chat say it all really informative really positive makes us feel like we're in control um, by giving us the sort of knowledge that you've been able to give us today and to sift through all the available research and bring this to us we're just incredibly uh, privileged to be working with you um, the center is working very closely with ey in the workforce space uh, we feel very very lucky to be able to do that but can we give can we give um, our colleagues a bit of a virtual clap and thank them it is two minutes past one so i do want to finish close to time um, and what we will do is we will save all of these comments and questions and any that we haven't been able to answer we'll talk to our ey colleagues and think think, think and see if we can come back back to you on on those can i just make one quick suggestion sure. um deb is um looking at those kind of questions around um forecasting and kind of some health questions yes. maybe you might want us to have one of our public health specialists yeah, available for our yeah. next panel yeah, that would be fantastic, Sonia. That would be really a great, it's a great offer, everybody. Here we go. Sonia's always offering the next, the next sort of um, Tripex webinar for us to all stay informed. Thank you so much, Sonia. Just a wonderful friend and colleague of our sectors, and we really appreciate it. Um, take care of you and, um, and very wise words today. So thank you. Thank you, all of you.